Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening for this webinar hosted by HDB Beef and Lamb. My name is Katie Thorley, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Manager for Beef and Lamb within HDB. Tonight, I'm delighted to bring you the webinar on Feeding the U Part 2, uh, specifically for vets and consultants. And our presenter this evening is Leslie Stubbins. Leslie is an independent consultant and is well known within the sheep industry, especially for her nutrition work. And both Leslie and Kate, who, if you were here on part one, um, helped us in updating the Feeding the U manual. So the plan of action is Leslie will run through a presentation and then there'll be time for questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone has a question at any point, if you type it in the box on the right hand side where it says questions, then I'll endeavour to ask as many of the questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Um, at the end of the presentation. We've got about 100 people registered for this evening's webinar, and I'd like to just thank Elena, who's working behind the scenes to keep everything running as smoothly as possible. And hopefully we won't encounter any technical difficulties this evening. So without further delay, I'll pass you over to Leslie for Feeding the You, part two. Thank you, Katie. Good evening, everybody. Um, yes, this is part two. Um, I think as is part one, we've got quite a bit to get through in the time. So hopefully we can get through it without um, leaving too many gaps. But as Katie said, if there are questions, then uh, type them in as we go through and then Katie can sort them. So in part two, and I'm hoping that um, everyone has got access to a copy of the new um, Feeding the You, because I will just um, refer to one or two parts of that as we go through that you can look at at your leisure after the webinar and, uh, and re-look at some of the things, particularly perhaps the protein calculations. Um, so I'm going to go through protein requirements and sources of metabolizable protein first, and then we're going to have a go at just calculating the dietary supply of protein. Then have a quick look at choosing compounds and supplements, a bit of a reminder perhaps for many, but um, again, worth going over, I think, because it's a question that many of you will get asked and on farm you'll be given labels and so on um, by farmers. Then um, a short session just on the impact of body condition, quick um, look, at, see at the uh, KPI project and, and some of the preliminary stuff coming out of that. And then um, time allowing, we'll have a quick look at some troubleshooting and some practical issues and just maybe as much as anything to, um, to pull a few more questions out. So let's make a start. So just to pick up for the first slide, a couple of slides where perhaps Kate um, finished the other night. Um, the contribution from forage and new diet is absolutely critical. Um, and of course, from the farmer's point of view, much of that is down to the fact that, as you have seen in this graph on Monday, if you were online, um, grass in terms of its cost per unit of energy is far, far lower than um, compound nuts by a factor of four or five times cheaper. So it's always going to make sense to either use grazed grass or um, conserved forage, slightly more expensive for the diet. But there's another really, really good reason, um, and that is that as a ruminant, the U is always going to function better if we treat her as a ruminant, and that means we have to uh, give the rumen its base um, feed, which is um, fibre. And again, thinking about protein supply now, this is very, very important because the vast majority of the protein that the U will actually utilise is going to be derived from the rumen. So it figures that if we don't actually give that the substrates that it needs, give the microbes the substrates they need, we're going to actually um, reduce the amount of protein available to the U and or possibly be having to look at put expensive, undegradable protein sources into the diet. So there we have a room of microbes and they're going to need fermentable energy and nitrogen. So nitrogen has been broken down from the degradable portion of the protein in the diet. From that, they're going to grow, they then die, and the you digest them as they pass down into the, the lower gut. And that's going to be a main source of her protein. And then, of course, we have a small amount of protein that's going to escape the microbes, go undegradable and digested by the you direct. Both of those then go to make up metabolizable protein. And I'll talk about metabolizable protein. And that's the requirement that's actually in the Feeding the You book that we will use in um, a diet calculation. So very important that we actually get that top bit right first. The undegradable portion, yes, it can be um, quite um, 
important and we need to actually put that top up in but what we're trying to do first and foremost is to maximize the amount of protein we can get from the rumen and in doing so we'll also maximize the amount of forage that you can actually utilize so this section is section 2.4 in the manual so if you just want anybody wants to make a note of that so it's at your leisure you can go back and have a look at this and the other thing to point out at this stage is that um, when we were rewriting and feeding the U, before we wrote it, um, we did actually do a, a big literature review, and that's on the AHDB website. I think there's about 110 pages of it. But if any of it, um, you want to dig a bit deeper into um, some of the issues that get raised, then it should be covered in that literature review if, um, if you want to go back to it. So, protein then. The diet contains crude protein, and that's just basically nitrogen times 6.25. And then our crude protein, as we've just said, is made up of two different types. We've got rumen degradable protein, and that's the portion broken down by the microbes, and that's then going to be incorporated into what we call microbial protein. And to do that, the microbes need to use fermentable energy to break down their protein sources. And then we've got the undegradable protein, DUP, which passes through undigested. So the total protein supply to the sheep is what we call metabolizable protein, MP. And that's simply the total of those two things put together. So the microbial protein always comes first and will always be the higher percentage, the higher proportion of the metabolizable protein available. And then the bit of DUP that we add on the top. So in terms of microbial protein yield, there's a couple of things just to really cover off at this stage. The amount of protein that we get from the microbes in the rumen is affected by the level of feeding. So there you've got level of feeding one, two, three. Number one, one would be more or less maintenance when we're only feeding a relatively low um, energy diet. Two would be in getting towards late pregnancy. And then three would be very late pregnancy and early lactation when the feeding level is much, much higher. And the microbes actually play the game and they produce a bit more protein at that stage. Now, the other thing, very important when we're looking at diets, at calculating dietary MP supply, is that it's also dependent on the fermentable energy content of the diet. Because as we've already said, um, the microbes need that energy to be able to um, grow and break down the degradable protein into nitrogen. So generally speaking, what we're looking at is trying to find a balance of FME and RDP so that we have 10 grams of rumen degradable protein for every megajoule of FME in the diet. Now, that, that, those ratios change slightly at other times, but for the purposes of, of, of tonight, 10 is easy, you know, the perfect 10. If we remember that, then we're not going to go too far wrong. So our MP supply, MCP supply, the microbial protein supply, we have to look at the balance that we've got in the diet. So if room and degradable protein is less than requirements, so it's less than 10 grams per, me per megajoule of FME available, then RDP is going to be limiting and it's actually going to reduce intake and in the digestion of forage because it's the limiting factor. By the same token, if RDP ex exceeds FME, so there's more RDP, more than 10 grams per megajoule of FME, then there's going to be wastage in that a lot of the RDP will have to be recycled by the blood and by urea in the saliva, and that's, that's wastage. So what we're trying to do when we're balancing a diet up is we're aiming to balance exactly the RDP supply with the FME at that perfect 10. If we do that, the machine that is the rumen will work at an optimum level for us. Now, it doesn't matter if you've got a little bit of an excess of RDP. And in fact, um, many of you who um, do the metabolic profiles and so on, and you're perhaps doing them on dairy sheep or dairy goats, animals that are kept in for long periods of time, it's actually really very difficult um, to avoid having an RDP excess and finding that the ureas are quite high. Um, but equally, some of you will also be familiar with the fact that sometimes when you do them and a urea is low, if a urea is low, you've really got to look at the diet because it really does suggest that, that the rumen is being um, compromised by a lack of degradable protein. So 
The other thing that we need to understand is that that microbial supply, so those microbes are going to go down into the abomasum and be digested, um, how much of that is true protein that's going to be absorbed because clearly the U isn't going to be able to use 100% of it. So what the estimate and, and the research that was done, the estimate is that of that microbial protein, that cell protein of, of the microbes, is estimated to be 75% available as true protein. So we've already lost 25% of it. And then the estimate is that the digestibility of that true protein is 85%. So the factor we have to use, and this often gets a groan when we do um, workshops and seminars on this, we have to use what we, if you want to call it a fudge factor, that's fine. But we have to um, then calculate 75% of 85 um, as the digestible true protein. And this is the figure that you will see quoted if you go into AFRC and so on. It's the figure that we use, 0.6375. If you want to use 0.64, it doesn't really matter. Um, but whatever figure we calculate is available coming out of the rumen, we have to then multiply it down by um, 0.6375 to actually give us the true protein that's digestible to the U. So just quickly, for example, if we have a diet and we calculate that it's got 10 megajoules per kilogram dry matter of FME, and we're feeding it twice maintenance, so the, the, the ratio of 10 is absolutely fine, then we are looking for 100 grams of RDP. Our RDP needs to be at least 100 or more if we're going to get our perfect 10. So nothing is limiting there. We're saying that RDP isn't limiting. If RDP was less than 100, it would be limiting, and we would have to use that figure. If FME was less than 10, and the, and the RDP was 100, we would have to use the FME times 10, and that would be the figure that we use. But we've got the perfect 10 there. So in this case, we can use 100. So the microbial protein yield before applying the efficiency factor is 100. But then applying the factor of 0.6375, what the U has available to her is 63.75 grams of microbial protein. And we would add to that the DUP contribution from the components of the diet, and that would give us the total metabolizable protein supply. And that's often a step that perhaps people get a little bit confused by. It is just making that potential protein into what is truly digestible protein so we can assess the diet. OK, so just one, two other things about protein. Um, and, and again, I'm sure Kate covered this the other night that, you know, traditionally people think that they see this graph and that's, you know, that there's the um, fetal growth in the last eight weeks. Nutrition requirement is going up at a similar pace, of course. And at the same time, the space in the rumen is getting less. Now, one of the tricks that the rumen has is that in late pregnancy, the U actually has an increased efficiency of protein digestion. So John Robinson, who many of you will have heard of, um, very much the guru still of, of, of sheep feeding, has said this for a long time, and it hasn't often been factored in by people, that she will increase her efficiency of digestion by about 15% in, in the, in, in the abomasum. So our fudge factor, if you like, is a little bit low. We tend not to take it into consideration um, because when we were doing the literature review with um, on protein and looking at levels, it was decided by um, a group of experts that we got together for a workshop to bounce ideas off that protein, we needed to look at the AFRC recommendations as being a minimum. So we tend not to factor this in, but it's a nice little cushion to realize that that's what's actually going on. And of course, the other thing to remember is that the reason why sheep um, don't all fall over dying in late pregnancy and don't need to be fed like pigs, although some people would still try and do it um, in late pregnancy, is that they've evolved to be able to basically make the rumen work faster. The rumen outflow rate increases quite dramatically in late pregnancy and early lactation, simply so that it can get through more food more quickly. Um, and so if you look at this, at maintenance, 2% of rumen contents leave the rumen each hour. That goes up to 5% at 
in late pregnancy and in very late pregnancy, particularly when we're feeding high quality TMRs, that will escalate again to 8% an hour. So a massive difference. And, and that's basically the evolutionary response of the sheep to be able to cope with increasing demand with a, a rumen that's being pressurized into a smaller space by the growing fetuses um, so it, um, they don't fall over and die. But it's what was really ignored for quite a long while. And people get very nervous about feeding forage in late pregnancy. They're not taking that into consideration. So one of the implications of this for protein nutrition is that we need to be very careful. Um, and in the back of the manual, for those of you who've got it in front of you, you will find in the appendices that there are um, the actual uh, some constituent parts of diets where we've actually laid out the ME, the FME, but also you'll see that there are different degradabilities of proteins according to room and outflow rate. And this is really important. You can see here an example for soybean meal. Um, and at an outflow rate of 0.05, um, then the soybean meal, 325 grams of the protein is degradable and 140 undegradable. But when we move to very late pregnancy and early lactation, because it's going through the rumen so much more quickly, it's less degradable. So it is a much higher undegradable source and the degradability falls uh, and this can be a pitfall particularly when people are doing tmrs for the first time and are perhaps some of silages are compromised when you look at some silages um, and i would encourage you to go and look at some analyses again after tonight you'll find that you've got less than 10 grams of degradable protein to every megajoule of fermentable energy particularly in some of the big bale silages and therefore you really are needing to put some degradable protein with it and if you forget that and in late pregnancy suddenly your protein source becomes less degradable what you find is your rumen's not working so effectively intakes drop and the wheels start to come off the whole process so it's really important to make sure when you're checking these out you decide what the outflow rate is going to be when for the point in time in the production cycle and you use the right degradability for your protein sources. So always check the RDP level and outflow rate. And if you look in the manual index, you'll find that there's some of the most common constituents there um, that um, you can use. So in terms of metabolizable protein, then again, this is, I think it's page 29, pretty sure it is, um, in the um, manual. Then, then this is the table that's there. We've got U weight, um, singles, twins, and we've got some triplets there for the 70 kilo U. And then we've got weeks before lambing. So at three weeks out, we're looking for 112 grams of metabolizable protein. So remember, most of that's going to come from um, microbial, maybe a little bit from DUP. And then in a very late pregnancy, 126 grams. And as I've just said, we would now consider those having done the literature review and reviewed a lot of the work, for example, that's been done. Excuse me, I'm going to have to have a quick drink of water. <coughs> for example, the work that was done with um, peripartunate rise in ewes. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that would be a minimum. And one of the things that, that we think um, has been happening with the periparturant rise is particularly where you get ewes which are challenged body condition wise, and we'll come to that. Um, that's when you might see a response to higher levels of protein. So I thought it might just be worth just running through a quick example of um, how we would calculate a metabolizable protein supply. And this is an example that, that Kate actually did um, ready for the. Um, workshops that we've been carrying out and it was um, looking at assessing grass as a soul feed up to lambing and it's a really good example i think um, of, of how we can underestimate the ability of the rumor to produce protein if we don't go through the calculations so what we've got here is um, a u three weeks out from lambing and at lambing i've done both and you'll notice on this side here that we've got 112 and 126 grams of metabolizable protein required and we have grass there and I've used the tables in the manual again go back to the manual as Kate will have talked about 
um, on Monday to decide what your dry matter potential is. And in this case, it's 1.58. And then we work that through from the knowledge that we have of our use. So we've got 2.25% of body weight is our 1.58. Our grass in the spring is 12 megajoules per kilogram dry matter, FME of 11. And our ERDP is 122 and DUP is 30. So the first thing to notice from that is that FME 11, ERDP 122, then there is no limitation there. We're going to be able to use um, FME times 10, so 110. So we just work it through. So calculate the microbial protein supply from the FME. So our first one is we've got 117.4 megajoules of FME, so that's 1.58 times um, 10, sorry, 11 is 17.4. So 174 grams potentially from FME. If FME wasn't limiting, then we would have the potential just looking for the RDP supply from that 1.58 kilograms of dry matter of 192 grams from grass alone. But FME is limiting, so the microbial protein yield is going to be based on the 174 grams. 174 times our efficiency factor, add in the DUP, um, and I'll show you this in the table in a minute, and we've got 158 grams per day of protein in total. So that's in excess of requirements up to lambing. And if we just have a look at that in the table, so it's filled in. And again, these tables are quite useful. I think if you're doing these calculations for the first time is to produce yourself a little calculation table like this. Um, so you can uh, effectively do it longhand to stand with and understand how it's being done. So across the top here now, we've got our ME, which is 19. So well in excess of what we need. FME, 1.58 times 11. ERDP, 1 times 2. Um, but because um, that is limiting, we had to use the 174. So we had 174 and times 0.6375 plus 47 gives us 158 grams. So we're way in excess on spring grass in terms of metabolizable protein supply. And um, even in late pregnancy, we're way over where we need to be. And this is actually quite a useful example because where we're getting some of these later lambing flocks now, that perhaps lambing um, late April into May, grass is really growing, um, you can find, if you're not careful, that some of these ewes are getting quite fat. There's 19 megajoules going in there, and even at lambing, they only need just over 18. So there's a case for thinking about rationing grass, using electric fences or whatever, um, but it can be that they're getting over the top. But I hope that's a little example, and, and again, it's worth just perhaps going back through that afterwards just to understand how that's been calculated. Okay, so that's a little a look see on protein nutrition, um, and it's quite difficult to do that in a very short space of time, but um, hopefully that's given you a flavour for how we do it. Calculate the microbial first, then top it up with a little bit of sweeties in terms of the DUP. A couple of slides now on compound quality. Um, here we've got what you would always find. I'm just really going to go through now a couple of slides as to what we see on the labels because we can actually tell quite a lot from them. So legally, we have to have the oil, ash, fiber, and the crude protein as required. Um, so oil, not too high. We don't want too much oil going in there. No use to a rumen. Um, so we really don't want more than 5% oil. Ash, we want to be less than 10% because ash is basically what's left if you put it in a bomb calorimeter and it's all the minerals and trace elements and all the rubbish. Fiber, normally less than 10%, but it can be a bit more sometimes depending on ingredients, which we'll come to in a minute. Crude protein as required. Many, many people get sucked into thinking that crude protein is a direct measure of what the overall quality of the compound is. Um, if I tell you that you could make a 20% crude protein compound out of tar feather, feathers and sawdust, um, and it would be 20% protein, then that kind of puts it into perspective, I think. What we've got to look at is the next thing down, which is the list of ingredients. And again, it's understanding and perhaps using some of the, the table in the back of the manual uh, or access to other 
sources of ingredient quality that you can begin to make a view um, of how good or bad a compound is. So typical ingredients then are things like wheat, wheat feed, wheat distillers, sugar beet, barley beans. They're all really good things to have in there. Rapeseed meal, again, no great problem with that. Um, it's a source of RDP. Um, just got to be a bit careful that it's perhaps not a huge amount in there. Start to get a little bit concerned when we see a lot of sunflower meal and palm kernel in there because they are lower quality. Some of the sunflowers are high pro, so again, make sure you look at it carefully as to what it is. And then obviously soya bean meal. So for quality protein, yes, we'd be looking at soya bean meal, but there's no reason why we wouldn't um, be looking at some rapeseed. Quite a lot of wheat distillers, dark grains are going in there as well now. Again, quite a good source of protein. But the trick of the tale, I think, when we're looking at labels is to find out where the molasses is. Because when we look at the label, the ingredients are in descending order. So the first one in the list is the highest percentage and then it's in descending order. And typically, if you find molasses in the list, it's usually in there at about 5 to 7 percent inclusion. So anything before it is going to be higher than that. Anything after it is lower. So soya bean meal before molasses in the list means there's a really good level of there in there. But then if you're getting palm kernel and sunflower above it, that means that they're getting up to quite high levels. And similarly, if soya bean meal is well below molasses, then you know that it's not in there at a very high percentage. So uh, you can just look at the label and you can get, a, after you've looked at a few, get a really good feel for whether it's a good, bad or indifferent um, quality product. And to be honest, uh, quite a lot of the big compounders now, sometimes you have to stamp your feet a little bit, but most of them are very good. If you ask them for an ingredient list, many of them will give you that and they will also give you, um, the, you know, to the nearest percentage point how much is in there. And then that makes life a lot, lot easier. Some of them will even give you the full printout and it will give you the ME, FME, RDP, DUP and everything, which obviously is absolutely brilliant if we can get that. Okay, um, body condition. Um, and as many of you know, I've been, we've been doing a lot of work on this. We've been doing the um, Key Performance Indicator Project uh, with AHDB for several years now. And whilst there's still quite a lot of analysis to be done on the actual data, there are just a few points I think I want to make really to underline the importance of body condition. We can talk about um, energy and protein nutrition in late pregnancy and early lactation and doing diets, calculating diets, looking at troubleshooting, etc. But the bottom line is that if we're failing to hit these targets of body condition score, we're always going to be pushing a certain amount of water uphill. So everyone, I think, will be familiar with these targets. We've had these targets around for a long while. And um, one thing that the KPI project hasn't done is blown those out of the water. Uh, but certainly for lowland use, um, you know, we are saying now these are really targets that we really should be hitting. Falling short of these um, is leading to a reduction in performance. And of course, one of the things we've been able to do with the KPI project, which we never could do before, was with large groups of animals, actually be able to follow individuals and be able to look at the impact of body condition and body condition change on individuals in different scores at different times and, and analyze that. And it really does um, give us a much more powerful view um, of its impact. So, Again, we're looking, of course, at the production cycle. And again, I'm not going to dwell on this, but I think everyone hopefully uh, appreciates that that production cycle and the effects that there are of not meeting those targets at any one of those times. I think everyone would be would be um, okay, okay with the fact that there's going to be an impact on performance. But what the KPI um, project has done is it's been able to expand that into some much more longitudinal effects of body condition score. And in particularly um, the relationship between weight of lamb weaned. And in fact, um, we're tending to look as much, much more critically now at um, eight week weights as well as weaned weights. 
but the effect of the body condition score at mating and particularly weight gain from weaning to mating and that the effect that that has on the eight week weight of lambs the following season and the weight of lambs weaned. Um, effective view body condition on scanning, lambing, the loss of body condition score from lambing in fit use and if they're lean use, leaner use, perhaps a gain. So, sorry, I'll just go back to that one. So just looking at those and those impacts. And I just want to give you an example of one of the flocks now just to underline that. So this is one of the three KPI flocks and that started off at the beginning of the project with a flock um, with body condition scores that were relatively low. So what this um, blob graph does is it groups the ewes in the flock. So this is about a thousand ewes. The bigger the blob, the more ewes in that body condition score. So that arrow is more or less pointing at condition score two and a half. Below that, you've got two and quarter. And below that, you've got quite a big blob with quite a few of the ewes in condition score two. Um, so a lean flock, big spread across the flock. Uh, in fact, the history of this is that there had been quite a nasty brush with hemonchosis, and just to uh, give you the technical reason for that. Um, but a big job. And you can see as you follow those blue bobs through to the following topping um, at scanning, managed to increase, improve things a bit by keeping things going and making sure there's food in front of them. By lambing, they drop back a little bit again. And by eight weeks, they dropped again, um, but they clearly didn't have that much to give. In the following year, we worked very hard to get those blue ones up to at topping the following year. So the blue ones at the far right then transfer into be these red ones at this side. Worked very, very hard on that flock, culled out some of the really lean ones, the old ones, and got them into a much more um, the condition that we'd want them to be. And throughout that year, they stayed in better condition and through the year. And the impact of that on the eight week weights on that farm was quite significant. So in the first year, the eight week weights averaged 19.6 kilos. In year two, they were 21.6 kilos. So a two kilo increase. And that was um, mainly down to U body condition. I wouldn't like to say that there weren't other things that we tweaked, but U body condition was the KPI that was being worked to. And that meant that we had to pay attention to things like lameness because lame use tend to be thin use. So everything else gets dragged in, the nutrition gets dragged in to keep the body condition, but the KPI was body condition score. And you can also see from this that one of the other things that we use within the KPI is the percentage of lambs that are small. And these are lambs that are a less than 85% of the target, which is 20 kilos. So 20 kilos is our benchmark figure. And you can see that they also dropped back. There were fewer lambs struggling. Um, and these are lambs that we actually got to the stage now where we think in terms of at about eight weeks, we might lift some of these lambs off the ewes because they just sit there, stunt, die. Um, and if we lift them and put them on some creep, we make a better job of them. But that was an impact of using body condition as the KPI. So just one or two other graphs here. So obviously we would expect that as use here, so loss of up to you body condition score at lambing and lamb live weight at eight weeks, we would expect to see this, that the better condition that they were in at lambing, the better the condition, the better the weight the lambs were at eight weeks. And in this case, and this is actually that same flock, um, one body condition score at lambing in that year was worth 5.4 kilos in terms of lambs wean. So if we took that forward to weaning and we looked at that, it was worth 5.4 kilos of lamb at weaning, which is not insignificant at all, a major impact. Going back to eight week weights, and again, now the graph on the right hand side is um, you body condition score loss from lambing to eight weeks. And this is the combined weight of twins. So again, we can see that the more body condition score the ewes lost, the heavier the twins were. And of course, that's a direct reflection of the fact that normally in early lactation, grass supply is limiting. There isn't enough dry matter to keep the ewe lactating at optimal levels. And so she has to utilize body condition. And so the impact of actual body condition on land performance is a function of the fact that if she's got it, she can utilize it, she will lose it. 
On the left hand side is also quite a significant impact on the same measurement of combined weight of twins at eight weeks, but this time it's change of U body condition score from weaning to mating in the previous summer. So the after weaning the previous year. And we can see there that there's quite a relationship between those who gained weight and that from weaning all the way up to mating again. And we can actually take this out and take out some of the uh, noise behind what actual body condition score was as well. So that impact's quite important. And, and I know Neris has got more analysis to do, but certainly what the evidence is suggesting to us now is that you know, we can't afford to let use lose body condition score in the post tupping to scanning period. And that's been something which has been talked about for a long while, but our data would very much support that we need to work to keep them at least at the same weight and body condition score and preferably gaining a little, particularly younger years all the way through. So there we are with our flock again. This is where we were in year one, and this is where we were in the second year. And just really to sort of say to you that there is a big implication for this in a flock as well. So what we also did was to calculate how much grass dry matter we needed in both of those years um, to be able to get using body condition score three and less um, back up to where they needed to be and hold the three pluses. Um, at at least the same level. And you can see in that year, that first year with the blue bobs, what we needed was for that flock over 150,000 kilos of dry matter of grass. Whereas in year two, when they were in better condition, it was just over 100,000 kilos of dry matter. Now that 50,000 kilos of dry matter is the difference between having to sell all your lambs as stores um, and being able to keep some and grow them on. It can be as simple as that. But again, we can actually calculate now where we want to be. And it does underline, so there's 50% less dry matter required. It does underline the fact that what we need to, need to do is to think about the long-term impacts, but equally, not just simply because of long-term impacts, but because of the um, requirement for dry matter and the lack of efficiency is to keep within those target ranges at all times. There is no... Um, scope for be, for saying it's a good idea to let ewes get thin. Um, it's never going to be um, an easy road back and it's always going to have a longer term impact. So it does drive decisions such as when to wean, sell store lambs and so on. When you start using body condition as you're driving KPI, I've mentioned mid-pregnancy nutrition, having a rethink on that one. Protein requirements, again, the MP requirements for FRC are fine with using good condition. Where user below that, then you need to be topping them up. And also in late pregnancy feeding levels. And as I've just said, um, it's an overarching KPI and we can fire lots of other things to stick to it, like lameness, um, like other types of nutrition, like grassland management. If you're using that as your KPI, the rest of it gets sucked in and you can make it work. OK, um, we're, we're running on time now, so I'll just very quickly run through one or two troubleshooting things. As I say, as much as anything, perhaps to, to tee up one or two questions that might be in people's minds. So just to remind us that what we're trying to do is to optimise the amount of forage intake. And one of the things I would always say is um, when people have got problems, we need to be monitoring forage intake. So it's really important to get a feel from a farmer. How many bales are you feeding? What's the dry matter? How many ewes are you feeding? And match that against what you think the predicted intake should be. And what we're trying to do is optimise because we're trying to actually disrupt our rumen as little as possible. The more concentrate we put in, the more we disrupt it. So we're trying to put in the smallest amount of the best balanced concentrate that we can. And of course, your TMR there is going to always be, um, you know, the, the, the acme, if you like. But what we're really trying to do is to get near as near to it as possible. So our TMR then, absolutely how we would like to do it if we could. If we're feeding things like straw or big bell silage, we've got to be aware that they're going to have to work harder for it. If it's long fibre, then it's going to reduce intakes. So 
So the theoretical intake to what's actually happening can be quite dif different. And certainly if we're feeding straw, um, I was on, the, on this farm yesterday, actually, and the old girls were doing exactly this again. You know, put it out there, let them rootle through it, let them leave at least a third, if not more, of what's put in front of them and pick out the best bits. It really does matter how we present forages and the fact that we must monitor them. So common problems are too many using a pen, not, not enough access. So uh, I think it's been mentioned that we are looking, um, we're looking for 150 mils usually um, for a half bread type U forage access. Um, a tape measure in the pocket is really useful if you're going on farms, um, just to whip it round a, a ring feeder like this and just to be able to say, well, look, you, you've only got so many meters of, of, of space and how many use have you got in the pen? Um, and, you know, a, a not uncommon site, a nice bale of hay stuffed in a corner with very little access and lots and lots of wastage. So, again, our TMR, I, you know, people, farmers say, oh, you know, I can't possibly do that. No, I'm, and not everyone's going to be able to have a set up, set up like that. Of course they're not. But my point is this, that what we're striving for in every situation is to get as near to that as possible when we're trying to put diet in front of them and when we're doing the diet calculation, the nearer we get to it, the better it's gonna work. And another thing is um, where there are problems um, and if uh, people are going on farms, just take the time to stand and observe. Um, at lunchtime, that's what I like to see. There's still TMR in front of them. There's the odd you perhaps having a look um, and taking a mouthful, but they're sat doing what they should be doing, which is ruminating. Um, if, on the other hand, when you get there, this is what you're seeing at any time of day. Um, the raiding party at the back because there isn't enough space. Sheep wheelbarrowing because they're on their knees trying to, uh, to get to it. Uh, and the odd dirty back creeping in, then you know you've got a problem. The two, that's the same farm, incidentally. On the right before the new shed was built and on the left with the new setup, the diet is exactly the same. The amount they use eat on the right is a lot less than the ones on the left and the outcomes are so much better on the left but the diet is exactly the same and again with concentrates um, trough space really important um, but if there is a problem then one solution that you can look at is floor feeding and i would say don't be frightened of it it's not something that you start doing with a flock straight away six weeks out from lambing they do need training to it um, but it really does have some advantages. It alleviates the speed space thing. It reduces the speed concentrates are consumed. And again, this is my um, straw fed flock um, that I was with yesterday. We do have to feed a kilo of concentrates to these ladies in late pregnancy. Um, and the fact that they are spending quite a good part of the day eating their half a kilo at one end, either end of the day, we don't get any acidosis or twin lamb issues. Um, it really helps evens up the intakes and reduces any physical trauma. So it's certainly worth considering. And again, don't forget um, organizing groups. And I'm sure everyone knows that, but you know it is really important and it can make a difference. And particularly, seems to be a, um, a little bit missing off the end of there, particularly um, the age of the ewes. So young ewes will always tend to hang back and, and keeping them, giving them perhaps a little bit more space, a little bit of time to settle before the main flock comes in, makes a massive difference. And I'll just tee this up now, um, you know, self-help options, of course, they can be useful. Uh, I won't say too much now because we're running out of time, but on the right, we've got an old girl there, a little bit of molasses, if she's finding it, life a little bit tough, absolutely no problem. And uh, on the left there, the, um, the three-in-one type feeder, um, again. So feed blocks and buckets, um, they have their place. Uh, I've just put one of my flocks on so some um, ones designed to be high in RDP for using with some poor quality forages, which is what they were designed for. Um, they are used more widely now, but just be aware they are very expensive. So you need to be sure that that's what's needed, that the practicalities dictate it. Uh, and just to put it into perspective, you know, um, a feed block, they're probably even more money than that now, but they're going to cost you five or six pence per megajoule of energy, as opposed to even a compound at 2.3, 2.5. So double the cost. 
And remember, grass is down there at somewhere like 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Um, so you've got to be able to justify it. And also, I think, sorry, and also I think remember that the contribution they're going to make is really very small. So you've got to factor that in um, and look at it and look at the whole diet and whether or not that contribution is going to be enough. Okay, I think that's, um, Katie, is me finished and uh, we've got time for questions. Hopefully that's teed some of them up. Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. Um, just while I wait for some questions to come through, just remind you that the presentation has been recorded this evening. So if you need to go back and recap on any of those calculations that Leslie's just run you through, um, it will be available on the YouTube channel um, in a couple of days and you should get an email to alert you on that and the copy of the feed in the U manual if you haven't already seen it is on the website or if you email or call BRP we'll be able to send you a copy out. Right Leslie the first question um, how many weeks uh, after tupping is it safe to feed red clover um, silage or in the field? Uh, well, they're t they are slightly different, but normally we would say you would leave it for six weeks before you would certainly introduce red clover as grazed led red clover. Uh, red clover size probably hasn't got the same uh, um, level of issues, but uh, certainly I would leave it until six weeks. OK, thank you. Um, the next couple seem very long. Um, FME E. R D P and D U P figures are not always available for silage from a silage analysis and mm. concentrate feed label. Does Leslie have some rules of thumb to help use FME and MP uh, systems to formulate rations for sheep when these parameters are not available? The silage analysis seem more uh, set up for dairy rations than than for sheep. Yeah, and it is it's a real frustration. Uh, my short answer is I use I use a lab that does that for me, and I do that deliberately. Um, so there there is uh, there are labs that will do that, and also if you ask some of them specifically, they will actually give you those figures. Um, so I obviously don't want to use names tonight, but but it's worth asking. Um, or if some if anybody wants to email me, I'll give them the details of the lab I use. The other thing that you can do if you're faced with it is to you know just get the standards out so use the standards use the ones that are in the back of the feeding the you and take a view so if you're looking at a silage remember the fme is the energy that's available that isn't um, vfas vfas the um, the um, volatile fatty acids are as an energy source from from fermentation that's just going to go straight through the wall of the rumen into the bloodstream and the you will use that as she uses the vfas that the microbes give her as an energy source so where you get these very high quality silages with low sugar for sugar levels high vfas the fme is going to be relatively low so use a benchmark that you can perhaps find in in the um feed in the you book or in, in other man in other places to give you a feel for it if it's a big bale silage and it's got high sugars and it's quite high dry matter and the VFAs are going to be low, then the FME is only a shade lower than the ME. And with RDP and DUP, again, just have a look um, and you can usually get some solubility. I mean, there are some um, equations that Kate actually um, un un unearthed um, to be able to do it. So again, if anybody really wants those, but usually you can use some book values and you can actually use um, a, a, an estimate to be able to move it forward. But the best thing is I just stamp the feet and use the lab that um, that does it. OK, thanks, Leslie. Um, another one, um, given the comments regarding body condition score, would you recommend keeping different age groups separately? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, not necessarily when you get mature use. Um, but certainly your youngest and perhaps your oldest use that need a little bit of TLC, but perhaps different types of TLC. I think that's worth it. Uh, and certainly with the younger use, um, when we were doing the literature review, the, and the evidence that we could find on, say, blocks and so on was actually quite old. It was dusty out of, the, out of my archives. But there's some really interesting stuff that we tend to forget now about the fact that if you have self-help self -help systems, the young ewes always lose out because the old ewes just muscle them out. And so with blocks and so on, the young ewes are taking virtually nothing. Um, and so those systems, it's absolutely vital. 
Okay, and have you got any advice on feeding new lambs from weaning through to service and then from lambing through to lactation? <laughs> um, that would be a whole webinar in itself, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, there is advice in the manual on that. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the easy thing to say now because of time is to say that, you know, you need to set targets on weight. So obviously the Challenge Sheep project now is looking at that in more detail. And the KPI project, we looked at it and we can say from that that it's really important that these ewe lambs are hitting targets so that they are 60% of their mature body weight when they go to the ram. The shearlings, they then make it to 85%. And so monitoring growth, getting that growth steady, not allowing them to lose a lot of weight at any stage is really important. So I think, Katie, at this stage, that's all I would say. There is a section in Feeding the Ewe on replacements, and that will answer some of the, a little bit more detail on that. Okay, thank you. Um, what are the maintenance requirements for ME and MP? They can only find the tables for the last seven weeks of pregnancy. Are those in the manual? Uh, no, they're not in the manual, actually. Um, they are in AFRC, um, and certainly it depends on, this, on the size of the U, but generally speaking, you're looking at, um, for a half-bred U, you're looking at maintenance of being sort of eight, nine megajoules of ME, and the MP, and I'm digging my brain now, but it's going to be around about 70 to 80 grams. Okay, thank you. Um, when would you add minerals to high quality silage um, in a TMR ration pre lambing? Right from the start. So I would always be adding the right speck of mineral, 20, 25 grams per head per day, right the way through. Okay. What you've got to watch on high quality silages and TMRs is um, it's the only time where you have to be careful that you also keep an eye on your magnesium levels. So whereas we would never add magnesium to a diet normally, the TMR you are looking um, at just a, just a mineral with perhaps five or six percent mag in, but you need that in there um, because you can run into hypermagnesemia. Okay, thank you. Um, and what would you recommend as the ideal, uh, the, sorry, the ideal time to do the metabolic profiles um, pre lambing? Uh, if you're going to do them, then you've got to do them at three to four weeks. Um, if you do them too soon before that, then it's not really giving you a snapshot of um, what's going on. If you do it any closer, then um, well, arguably at three to four weeks, uh, I'm not sure what you do with it. Um, but if you leave it any later, you surely, you surely can't do anything with it. Um, so three to four weeks, but, and there is a big but there because if you do it and things aren't right, seriously, there is a limit to what you can do. So there was some information put out um, three or four years ago, I think, that related to BOHBs and that if BOHBs were, I forget what the level now is, but X amount over where the benchmark was for every unit, feed half a kilo of concentrates more, which is an absolute disaster on wheels. Um, that's the last thing you do because you just kick them into acidosis. So if the BOHBs are high, there really is a limit to what you can do. You can maybe nudge the protein, check that, check the diet. But if you make a big change to a diet, then it will just make things worse. Um, I think metabolic profiles are probably their most useful where you want just to have confidence and where you want the client, the farmer to have confidence in the diet. And then they're really, really useful, particularly if you've made some changes. Okay, thanks, Leslie. And the final question this evening, um, if the forage analysis hasn't got ERDP and DUP, can you reliably calculate them from other protein data that is given? Yeah, you can calculate it from them. If, if you are given the um, degradabilities, then there are equations that can be used. And if you look at those, and again, as I say, if you look at those and you just look at some, some um, book values for similar silages, you can come to a sensible figure. Um, and so you can appraise a diet. But ideally, you know, you get one done that's done, uh, done as we want it to be done. 
Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. And thank you very much for everybody for listening this evening and giving it your time um, and all the participation with the questions. Um, I hope you all have a lovely evening and I hope you're able to actually implement that information um, on your clients' farms and to help um, everybody improve their new nutrition. Thank you very much. Good night.